Let's take our Bibles this morning and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 as we get started with our Sunday School Hour. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. You can look for verse 11 when you get there. <clears throat> All right. This is, I think, our ninth or tenth lesson in this series as we go through the book of 1 Corinthians and see how the Church of Corinth gives us a lot of God's principles for us to learn from. And uh, it's difficult because I want to go over a review of the last... Uh, eight or ten lessons and bring us up to date because we've seen so much and how all these things fit together in God's word. But uh, the context has been that we've looked at the uh, Apostle Paul was writing the church in Corinth and he talked about how the church in Corinth, they were getting a bit divisive and factious, you know, arguing over who their leader was and who they were following. Some said, oh, I'm of Paul. Others said, I'm of Paulus. Others said, I'm of Cephas. And some said, I'm of Christ, you know, because they were the spiritual ones. And so there was a lot of argument and debate in the church. And then in this chapter, the Apostle Paul returns to the theme of saying to them, look, don't be so carnal and worldly and, and childish. He says, you need to get past this. It's not about the people who are laboring your, in your lives. It's about the God who is doing the work in you. He's the one who gives the increase. So we're going to talk a little bit more about the uh, connections that, that we find here in this context as we see God talking again here about the, uh, the illustration that we looked at last week of the church that is, in verse number nine, he said, ye are God's building. And so we're gonna look at the church again as a little bit of a building and how that the lives of the Christians are being built by the Lord. Um, it's easy for me to talk about building because that's what I do. I, I'm a contractor as well as a pastor, so I do a lot of building and construction. Uh, I've got lots and lots of illustrations, um, but there's no building that can be built really in the physical sense that's anywhere near as important as building lives. And so that's what we're going to talk about in this context this morning because uh, that's far more important than any construction project undertaken in the uh, construction realm. All right, so <clears throat> we're going to start by looking at verses 11 to 15. But I did want to I did want to start off by reminding you a bit about the context because in verses 9 and 10 we do find the context helps us understand this passage better. Maybe let's read the text first from verse 11 to 15, and then I'll, we'll touch on the context. So starting at verse 11, it says, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work should be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it should be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. All right, let's pray before we continue. Father, thank you again for the opportunity to get, uh, open your precious word and to see your truth revealed for our lives. Help us, Father, as we yield ourselves to you and mm -hmm. seek your direction on this special day that you would uh, speak to us in this hour. In Jesus' name we pray. <coughs> Amen. All right, so here we are looking at this passage of Scripture, and um, we see here the context, and I think this is such a familiar text of Scripture to us when we talk about gold and silver, precious stones, wood, hands, double, and how those works are going to be tried by fire, and it talks a lot about the, the judgment seat of Christ and the, the uh, rewards that we receive later as we stand before our Savior at the end of our lives. And I think that so often when we talk about this passage of Scripture, we apply it to the things that we're building in our own lives. But I wanted to come back to what we looked at last week in verses 9 and 10. We find the context is actually a build, building in the lives of other people. Because in verse 9, he says, We, speaking of himself, the apostle, and his fellow laborers, Paul, Apollos, and the others, we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's build, husbandry. Ye are God's building. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. Let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. And so he's talking about you guys are our construction project as servants of the Lord and as ministers of the gospel. And so I want us to understand this, this passage that we're studying this morning in the context of what we looked at last week and see that um, though the truths that we will see can be applied to us building the things in our own lives, I think that, that that's not really what the context shows is God's purpose for this text. He's really, I believe, talking about the ministers and laborers and workers who are investing in the lives of others. Now, not just apostles and pastors, but anybody who's building the lives of others for the sake of the Lord and, and God's work. So the title of the message this morning is Building a Life for God. It's not just about building your own life, though these principles will apply to ourselves as well, but particularly building the lives of others for the glory of the Lord. 
So the first point this morning is starting, because in verse 11, as we saw last week, um, other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And so the, the starting point is important. Starting right is important. Everywhere that we begin, we have to start right. We gotta start on the right footing and start in the right direction. Now that applies certainly with salvation. Obviously this is talking about the salvation and the gospel that uh, those who, who were being ministered to, he said obviously the first point you have to come to is you gotta start at Jesus Christ. There has to be salvation and uh, a response to the gospel there. Nothing can be built in a life uh, one, until that gospel has been established and the salvation is received through Jesus Christ. Uh, but that also works all its way through our lives, really. Uh, the, the starting point for everything we do as we minister in the lives of others, the starting point should always be Jesus Christ. It should always be that if I'm going to build anything in somebody's life, the starting point has to be Jesus Christ. He is that foundation. He says, other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. There's no other option when it comes to building for the Lord, but except the foundation has to start with Jesus Christ. And so as we look at this, I wanted us to notice not only is is that foundation key for salvation, but also for other areas of life. Um, decision making that needs to be done in life. Uh, the, the first question should be, what's the Lord's priority here? You know, what does the Lord want? Sometimes we look for wisdom, sometimes we seek counsel, sometimes we read books about things and try and get, get wisdom to make good decisions. But the first priority should always be, what does the Lord want? What is God's purpose for my life? Uh, what's God's word revealed to me? And certainly those other things are good, but the starting place has to be Christ. What is Christ's purpose in this situation? And as we find that, it's much easier then to know where we're going to build. It would be very difficult to construct a building if you didn't first know that the foundation was already laid, uh, what the foundation's shape was, what the foundation's size was. Because you could plan all this wonderful building that you were planning to do, but if it didn't fit on the foundation, you'd have problems. <laughs> uh, my wife and I, we lived in a house in Torrance, and uh, it was a very unusual situation because the, the original home that was built on that property was no longer there when we moved in. I don't know what happened to it. I wasn't able to find out from the neighbors who lived there for many years exactly what happened. I don't know if it burned down or if it just got run down and needed replaced. But what they did was they took the old house off, left the foundation, and then put a new house on top of the old foundation. And it wasn't a very good fit. <laughs> the basement was weird. <laughs> Because you had a foundation wall and then dirt and another foundation wall and weird corners and things that were happening. It was very unusual in that basement because they had put the wrong house on the foundation. They, they had to jury rig it to make it work and they were able to make it work and it was stable and we enjoyed living there. But they tried to put a house on a foundation that didn't fit. And that's the problem sometimes when we try to make decisions and we go to all these other places without checking the foundation first. Okay, what's Christ's purpose in this situation? What's God's call for my life? What is Christ's um, direction in his word for how to make these sort of decisions? Because uh, otherwise you can end up building this wonderful house in your mind, if I'm gonna make this decision, and then when it comes to reality, it doesn't fit the foundation and it collapses and everything comes to destruction. Um, so when we're making decisions, when we're scheduling, uh, scheduling our day, scheduling our week, scheduling our life, uh, the first foundation point is, I'm saved, I'm a Christian, I belong to the Lord. How does that starting point adjust my schedule for my day? You know, Lord, every morning, what wilt thou have me to do? Like Saul of Tarsus on the road, road to Damascus, right? And so everything has to start at Christ. If we're gonna build anything, you have to have the foundation in place and you have to build in relationship to that foundation or you're gonna have disaster. It's easy for us to find lots of examples of, of construction where there was not a proper foundation laid or where the foundation wasn't proper for what was gonna be built. Uh, even this building that we're in, we can talk about foundation issues, right? Uh, the reason that everything is so sloping and, and the walls are crooked and all of that in the original part of this building is because there was never a proper foundation laid for this building. And yes, you can say, oh yes, but this building has stood here for 138 years, 128 years. No, 138 years this building has stood here. No. Not very well. <laughs> yes, it's still here, and yes, it's still steady, and no, it doesn't seem like it's in any danger of falling over anytime soon. But, boy, it's not, it's not the way it should be. <laughs> Wall, walls are crooked, ceilings are crooked, floors are crooked. Um, because it never had a proper foundation dug down deep to solid footings. 
And so we need to build properly. Start at Jesus, whether it's making decisions, whether it's scheduling, whether it's preaching. Uh, you know, there has to be a foundation point of Jesus has to be the center of it all. That's why I put on the wall above my head, we preach Christ. Because yeah. Christ needs to be the center of everything that we're doing. He's the foundation. He's the starting point. And if it doesn't all fit into, into his context and the context of Christ in our life, uh, we're going to run into disaster in a hurry. And so that's why it's so important for us to have this starting place. The foundation for building lives is to start people at Jesus. You know what? You can do a lot of construction work on somebody's life, but if they're not saved, a lot of it's not going to work, right? And that's why so many times I, I, you know, I hear people working with somebody or see something going on and thinking, I don't know if you might just be wasting your time trying to convince them to use the King James Bible. They're not even saved yet, you know? Like You might be wasting your time trying to get them to have, have high Christian standards for their life and behavior. They're not even saved yet. You know, if you, if you try and build all that you like, but if the foundation's there, it's probably going to collapse. And I think that's why we've seen so many people through the years, not, not, I'm not speaking about our church, but just Christians that you and I have known in general, that seem to be doing really well, they got it all together, and then all of a sudden they've crashed and burned, and we go, what happened? And sometimes I think that maybe they weren't really saved, and they just, you know, made a profession, but they weren't really saved, and then they start, you know, learning all these things, and everybody's teaching them how to live a Christian life, but they haven't even been saved yet. And then, like Jesus said, the storm comes, the wind blows, and, and their life crashes, because they, they didn't have the foundation of Christ, either in salvation, or even if they had it in salvation, they didn't have it in their daily life. It was all just routine. It was just because people told them to do it. It was just because they've been trained and taught to do things just because somebody said so. But they didn't have a, a relationship with Christ. And if there's no relationship with Christ, guess what? Uh, the building's going to topple sooner or later. One day, it's going to cause a problem. And so we have to always start people at Jesus. You know, oh, oh, Pastor, why do I have to do this? Well, because you're a Christian. Jesus saved you. You know it starts at Jesus. It starts at the Word of God. It starts at because of the Lord, not because of anything else that we are doing. And that's what he's trying to center them around here. He's saying it's not about me. It's not about Apollos. It's not about Cephas. It's about Jesus. And it has to start there. You need that foundation in all of your ministry. So start people's lives at Jesus in every discussion that you have to have about Bible situations, about Bible truth. It's always going to start with the Lord, not about what psychology says or about what man's wisdom says or about what's practical and functional and what's going to work and let's be pragmatic about it. No, it has to start with Jesus. So the second thing, I, that was just a recap. You ready for point two? This is actually where we're going to start some fresh stuff because we looked at verse 11 last week. But verse number uh, 12, we're going to see some selection processes going on here. So the second point is selecting. In verse 12, he says, Now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. Now we already looked at verse 13, so we know what's going to happen to these processes and these uh, building materials. But we all get to choose how we touch other people's lives and how we interact with other people. And the ways that we build into their lives are really critical to helping uh, to build for the Lord the things that are going to really matter, the things that are going to last. And so we get to uh, touch other people's lives in a powerful way. What methods we use are important. What attitudes we, we express and have as we do those things, that's important. We need to be very careful about how we do it. I think I've got a couple verses here. No, nope, I don't have them. I forgot to make a slide for these verses, so I'll read them to you um, from Jude. Uh, we use different methods at different times. In Jude verses 22 and 23, it says, And of some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. And so we see there, he's saying, some you're working with them um, with compassion and tenderness, and others, he says, save with fear, pulling them out of the fire. <laughs> you know, uh, some people need different treatment depending on their situation. He says, some people you're tender and you're compassionate and you work with them gently, and other people you almost have to grab them out of the flames because they're on the brink of destruction. You know, and so it's there is different ways in which we minister to people, but we need to be careful how we do that. You know, there's some people are so easily offended that if you poke them they'll never come back, okay? And it's easy to say, I should grow up. Well, you wouldn't say that if a three-day-old baby got got offended and started crying when you poked it, okay? 
sometimes babies are babies and you know what you make allowances okay it's the grown-ups who need to be mature enough to handle babies like babies and not expect them to be grown-ups you say yeah well they've been saying for 35 years they shouldn't be a baby yes they shouldn't be a baby but they are one okay <laughs> it's the mature ones who have to uh, in romans 15 it says you then that are strong not to bear the infirmities of the weak mm -hmm. so the stronger you are as a christian the more able you should be to be led in the Lord's wisdom, to be tender and compassionate, to be gentle, to be firm when needed, but to have the wisdom of the Lord to treat people right and to use the right methods and attitudes in helping people, that we would do so for the Lord's glory. We need to be very careful what methods we use. There should be no harshness. There should be no bullying. There should be no manipulation trying to trick people into making a decision, trying to coerce them, trying to, you know, use techniques and strategies. Uh, the Apostle Paul said, we need to handle the word of God deceitfully with any cunning craftiness. There should be no deceit. You know, we should be very honest and truthful and kind and, and wise. Um, there are lots of ways that you can make things easier for people to help them make a good decision. But there's a big difference between trying to encourage somebody to make a good decision and trying to show them biblical reasons to do so and trying to try to use methods that sometimes can be manipulation. Sometimes they can be coercion. Sometimes they can be, you know, um, tricky strategies to try and, you know, cunning craftiness is the Bible phrase. So we need to be on guard against that. We use the right methods because otherwise you end up building something that's just going to crash in the long run and a lot of people are going to be hurt. Um, we need to build with things like truth, love, compassion, patience, <laughs> lots of patience, humility, meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted, meekness, strength, wisdom. We need to build well for the Lord's sake. I wanted to share with you 2 Timothy 2, verses 24 and the beginning of verse 25. It says, And the servant of the Lord must not strive... No, no fighting, no arguing, no contention. Must not strive, but be gentle unto all men. Apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. And so God's designed for Christian workers, those who are servants of the Lord, lots of gentleness, lots of compassion, lots of meekness. <laughs> you know what? Yeah, if you're trying to help somebody and they get mad at you, it's okay. Just let it go. Just be meek. <laughs> Don't worry about it. It happens. It goes with the territory. Um, lots of gentleness. Um, I, I have heard so many stories about pastors yelling at church members, uh, yelling at young people, screaming at them and calling them names and insulting them. And that doesn't sound like Jesus or the Bible to me. You, can, you, you might build a big church by be bullying everybody into doing what they're supposed to do and, and browbeating everybody and, and guilt tripping everybody who didn't. You know. That's not the way of the Bible, okay? You might build something big, but guess what's going to happen? All of a sudden, the wind's going to blow, the storm's going to show up, and the next thing you know, you're going to have a church split or you're going to have carnality in the church or you're going to have people doing things and stirring up trouble. And, or you're going to have people just, just crash their lives like a train wreck, you know, boom into a wall. And, and so we have to be careful how we build in people's lives. It's got to be the spirit of the Lord. It's got to be starting at the foundation of the, of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's got to be building with the proper materials of, of building in people's lives with gold, silver, mm -hmm. precious stones. Those quality materials that God gives us. Things like the word of God. Things like prayer. Things like encouragement. Things like compassion, you know, the ways that we build into people's lives makes a huge difference. It's not just the end justifies the means, okay? The means matter. And so we need to be careful about selecting the right materials to build into people's lives. Otherwise, we're going to build something that could be a disaster. It might look sharp on the outside, but inwardly it could be full of decay and rottenness. It's not going to stand the test. Uh, the third thing is showing. In verse 13, we find that every man's work should be made manifest. Everything that you have built in the lives of others, one day it's going to show. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. We need to be very aware that one day all of our ministry to others will get stress tested. 
And when it's put under pressure uh, of that fire, we're going to find out. Now, I really believe that this context is talking about for the day shall declare. I think it's talking about the judgment seat of Christ when you and I stand before the Savior at the end of our lives and the Lord puts all of our works for him through the fire. Now, gold, silver, and precious stones, guess what happens when they go through the fire? Nothing. They're fine. They survive just fine. Um, if you were to take quality jewelry and put it through uh, a fire, you could pass it through that fire, you could heat it up, you could pass it through, it would come out. It might be a little smoky, but it would survive just fine. Um, if you take wood, hay, and stubble and throw it in the fire, guess what? It's going to get destroyed. Mm -hmm. It's going to be completely destroyed very, very quickly. And so that's what I believe about the judgment seat of Christ. The works that you and I do for the Lord, one day they're going to pass through the fire. At the end of our lives, we're going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ, and he's going to pass all of our good works through that fire to test what we have done for him, and it's all going to be shown. But I do believe that there is also a level that scripture talks about um, that we will see in people's daily lives when they hit a fiery, fiery day, when they hit that time of stress, how their Christian growth is going to be tested will oftentimes reveal what we have built into them. Now, I wanted to give you another verse, but I wanted to turn to it, and that's in Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. The reason I wanted to do that is because when we get there, we're also going to look at some other verses nearby. But Matthew chapter 7 and verse 20 is a verse that I think is so familiar to us uh, that it's helpful. So Matthew 7, 20, Wherefore by their fruits ye shall know them. Now, I want us to see that because it's so familiar that we talk about, about that verse. I've heard it, people just quote it, you know, so often. But I wanted us to see the context of that. Because if we go back to verse number 15 and read the rest of the paragraph, which starts in verse 15, Jesus says, Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Do you remember the Bible interpreting principle that is king? Context, right? It's easy to quote, by their fruits ye shall know them, and say, ah, oh, yes, that person's living such a way, and I know. Uh, no, no, that's not talking about um, a personal walk with God and, and your fruits as an individual. It's talking about when false teachers are building in the lives of their followers, guess what you're going to find? You're going to know a lot about that false teacher by the fruit that he produces. Okay, And so we can take verse 20 and say, ah, oh, by their fruits you know them. But remember that that's the second time he says this in this context. And the first time is in verse 16, immediately after he starts talking about, beware of false prophets, ye shall know them by their fruits. And so when we're building and, and investing in people's lives, one of these days our fruit's going to show. Are we a false teacher or are we a true teacher? Are we teaching the word of God and building into lives the right way? Well, that's going to be shown in the lives of those that we minister to. Uh, those fruits will be revealed. And... That's going to happen when they hit problems in their daily life, but also at the judgment seat of Christ. And so there's, there's nothing <laughs> hidden, the Bible says, that will not be uncovered. And so as we build in the lives of others, uh, those labors are going to be stress tested and it's going to be shown. Now back into our uh, text in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, I want to look at our next point in verse number 14. And that is surviving. In verse 14, we see, If any man's work abide, or survive, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. And so we find that as we talked about those things uh, that we built in people's lives, those things will pass through the fire. And we will receive a reward, but only for that which survives the fire. And so as we build in people's lives and we're trying to help people grow in their walk with the Lord, as we're trying to invest in the lives of people for the sake of eternity, uh, we can be building all of these buildings in lives and we can be constructing and creating this huge ministry and these huge opportunities to build in people's lives. We might gather a crowd, 
But if it's not building right for the Lord, the right sort of work for the Lord, when we get to heaven and it's all burnt up, we'll, we'll come empty, empty handed. And that's the danger that we ought to be aware of and understand that there needs to be that, that um, focus on, I'm going to build for the Lord and for his glory and for his purposes and in his way with his materials. And so we find here that those things will survive the fire. Some things will survive the fire. Now, as we talk about the fire, what does the fire mean? Uh, fire is symbolic in the scriptures of a lot of things, but there's a couple of things that I think are helpful for us to have in our mindset when we think about the fire uh, that reveals, as it says there in verse 13, it shall be revealed by fire. Um, the first thing is, in Jeremiah 23, verse 29, the Lord says, Is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces? And so God's word is like a fire, and it can, it can prove and test our, our actions and our motives and the sort of work that we're doing. And I believe that at the judgment seat of Christ, one of the aspects of fire that will test what we have done for the Lord is... Does it stand up to the word of God? Is it what the word of God told you to do? Is it God's word that guided you in that? Is it following after the pattern of scripture? The Bible principles and the Bible patterns. Are we following after those? If we are, then we can stand that test of the fire. It'll pass through that fire if we can get past that. So the first part of the fire is, does it line up with the word of God? The word of God is a fire, and it will test what we're doing. It's very easy to look at that mirror of the scriptures, it says in James 1, and say, wow, <laughs> that doesn't look right. And as we compare scripture with scriptures, we compare what we're doing with the word of God. Are we following the pattern and principles of the word of God? That has to be our starting point for measuring, am I doing the right thing? Am I following the word of God and the principles that God's word teaches? That's why it's so important for us to have a thorough understanding of the scripture. The more we are doing for the Lord as servants and as teachers and as laborers in God's work, the more familiar I believe we need to be with the word of God. Because how are we going to know if we're doing the Lord's work in the Lord's way if we don't know what the Lord's way is and how his word reveals that? Don't just pattern your life and ministry after how everybody else is doing it. Because guess what? Everybody else could be wrong. It's got to be based on the Bible. If it stands up to the Bible test, that's important. It has to pass the Bible test. Mm -hmm. Is this inconsistent um, application of Bible principles and Bible patterns? Are we following after the scripture? The second fire, I think, is even more revealing and more searching. And we find that in Revelation 1 and verse 14. When it talks about Christ, it says, His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. His eyes were as a flame of fire. Do you know the eyes of Christ are referred to like a flame of fire in three different verses in Revelation? Revelation 1.14, Revelation 2.18, and Revelation 19 and verse 12. Three times he tells us in the last book of the Bible that the eyes of Christ are like a flame of fire. And so I believe that when he talks here in verse 13 about uh, it will be revealed by fire. I believe that one of the tests of scrutiny that our works have to stand up to before the Lord is the eyes of Christ. You know the eyes of Christ look a lot deeper than anything else. They look past just, does it line up with the Bible pattern? His eyes can see right into our innermost being. The Bible tells us in Proverbs, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. There is nothing hidden from his perception. And so the eyes of Christ will look at your life and mine and what we have built for the Lord in the lives of others. And he'll be able not just to see whether it lined up with the Bible pattern and principles, but what was the heart and spirit behind it? Was it done with the spirit of Christ? Was it done for the glory of the Lord? Was it done for the benefit of others? Or were we doing it just to get glory for ourselves or just to promote ourselves and build our own opportunities in ministry? Or what, what was the reasoning behind that? What was the thoughts and intents of our heart? And so the eyes of Christ can search those things. How will our labors stand up against the pattern of the word of God and the perception of the eyes of Christ? If they will pass those two fiery tests, I'm sure we'll do just fine at the judgment day. Now, you can say, Pastor, it doesn't say those two things in there. You're right. Maybe I'm wrong about the fire and, and the, the word of God and the eyes of Christ, but I think that's a pretty good guess for us to say, are my works going to stand up against the fire of judgment? Okay, the last thing we're going to talk about is suffering. We see that in verse number 15. It says, If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. 
but he himself should be saved, yet so as by fire. Now, we know that the, that as Christians, we are going to stand before our Savior at the judgment seat of Christ. We will not face condemnation for wrong. Our sins were judged in Christ at Calvary. So we don't have to go to the judgment seat of Christ fearful that we're going to be condemned, fearful that we're going to be destroyed, fearful that we can somehow lose our salvation. In Romans 8 and verse 1, it says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. You know what? We who are in Christ, uh, there is no condemnation. So we don't have to look at the judgment day of Christ, judgment seat of Christ and say, Oh no, I hope I don't get condemned for all the bad things I've done. No, no, if you're a Christian, all your sins are under the blood. God's never going to bring them up to you again. They're forgiven, they're washed away, they're as far as the east is from the west, right? And so we don't have to worry about that. We don't have to worry about wrath, because in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 9, it says, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. And so when we stand at the judgment seat of Christ, there's going to be no anger towards us. There's going to be no condemnation. You didn't do right. You didn't should have done better. No, no, no. There's going to be none of that. And so we don't have to fear that. But there is a, a loss of some of the rewards that we could have had. And that's what we see in verse 15. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. You're not going to lose your salvation. You're still going to go to heaven. If you're saved, you're saved. There's no way to lose that. But we do want to avoid losing some of the loss of the rewards that we should have had. Because in verse 14 it says, if your works abide the fire, you'll receive reward. But in verse 15, if your works burned, you'll suffer a loss of that reward that you should have had. And so how you and I live and minister today will affect the rewards that we have in eternity. Now, I don't know if we will see the pile of rewards we should have had. I don't know how that's going to all work when we get there. Um, sometimes people say, oh, well, you know, maybe that pile will be there. All of those rewards you should have had. And God's going to say, well, you could have had all that, but you didn't, you didn't serve me properly. I don't think that that's going to happen. But I do think that as we look at that day from this day, we, we ought to be mindful of the loss that we could sustain if we don't build right. We're not building people's lives the way that God has called us to and the way that God has sought for us to do. We need to labor for the Lord and make sure that our sort of work is right. It's often been helpful to me to be reminded from verse 13 that the end of the verse says, The fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. And it's been helpful for me to be reminded that it's what sort, not what size. <laughs> because sometimes people get too caught up in the size of a work. But the Lord's interested in the sort of the work. The greatest church in all the world is the church that's most like Christ. Not necessarily the biggest, not necessarily the richest, not necessarily the most talented, not necessarily the most popular, but that which is most like Christ. And so as we minister, we should be very concerned with the sort of work we're doing for the Lord. Less so the size, because you know what? Some of the greatest preachers in the Bible did not have much size of ministry. <laughs> Jeremiah, what a preacher, what a man of God, served the Lord for a long period of time. And uh, you know how many people you see in Jeremiah's record responding to his preaching and changing their ways? Not one. <laughs> okay, does that mean he was unfaithful? In his... Well, no, he was a faithful preacher. He stood for the Lord. It's not size that matters so much as the sort of work we're doing. I believe that when Jeremiah stood before his Savior at the end of his life, he got, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. That's what I believe. Did he have thousands of converts? No. I don't know if he had even a handful. But his sort of work was right. He stayed faithful in the midst of fierce opposition and persecution. And he did right. He honored the Lord. And so also you and I, whatever the results and outcome of our labors, whatever the size is, May we labor with the right sort, the right spirit, the right patience, the right humility, the right kindness and gentleness, the right compassion and truthfulness, the right firmness and strength on the truth, um, the right willingness to invest ourselves beyond, uh, beyond the point of sacrifice. If we will labor for the Lord, we can build lives for God. And the sort of lives that we can build for God makes a big difference for eternity, not just for us, but especially for those whose lives we help. Let's pray and ask God to help us with that.
Father, help us, I pray, as we look at our opportunities to minister to people around us, that you'd help us to be compassionate, you'd help us to be tender, you'd help us to be truthful, you'd help us to be strong in your, in your strength, you'd help us to be wise and, and used of you to build the right things in people's lives, starting at Christ and building from there that which will glorify you and help them. We pray for your help and guidance as we seek after you in this hour, and in the hour to come, we pray that you would work mightily in our special service this morning, that many would come, and that God would be a help. We pray for your blessing, in Jesus' name, amen.